especially want to welcome uh, Dr. Pines, my colleague, uh, friend, and now my boss, uh, the 34th president of the University of Maryland, uh, Daryl J. Pines, um, to this town hall, the purpose of which is really an opportunity for us to get acquainted with um, Dr. Pines and for him to get acquainted with us. Um, I have worked with him for the last uh, 10 years. I had never met him before that, but over these 10 years, I have come to know him as someone who consistently argues for issues of access, equity, justice, and inclusion. And I've found him to be a firm advocate for transparency and someone who you could always count on for straight talk. Over the years, he and I have hosted receptions for black faculty at UMD. We've co-led advanced workshops leadership training workshops, and um, been partners on a number of other things. So I'm really pleased and proud uh, to have you join us today and to introduce you to the brilliant, fierce, I know you know they're already fierce, and dynamic faculty um, in the college and staff in the College of Arts and Humanities. Uh, I know people have a number of questions and we thought the way this would work is um, uh, Dr. Pines will uh, have some opening remarks and I will ask him a few questions and then we will, we will have a little bit of a conversation and then we'll open it to questions um, from all of you, which will be, I will introduce our moderators at that time. So Dr. Pines, welcome. Uh, thank you, Bonnie, and, and thank you for your partnership over the last decade and your friendship and uh, your collaborations on multiple things and, uh, and also your advice. Um, and so good morning, everyone. Good morning to the College of Arts and Humanities. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, and I'm welcome the opportunity to discuss my priorities with you as our university goes forward. Um, the past several months have presented a set of challenges that we all didn't expect but are facing together. We're in the middle of a global health pandemic and are dealing with longstanding issues of racial injustice. These two pandemics have impacted us all in many different ways, yet it has connected us like nothing ever before in our history on the planet. In my first three months as president, you've probably heard me say that we must promote excellence in everything that we do, including research, innovation, creative expression, teaching and learning in the arts and humanities. We must also create an inclusive, multicultural campus environment. These two priorities are closely related. Excellence must be rooted in our values because what the university does matters to all of us and matters to our communities. I commend faculty, staff, and students of the Arts and Humanities College for your demonstration of excellence. Shortly after UMD announced that classes would be held remotely, I wanna give you several examples of what your colleagues did. The School of Music Associate Director for Academic Affairs, Gregory Miller, and the Senior Assistant Director for Productions Operations, Aaron Mueller, reached out to Matthew Bachman, our alum who is a manager of Steinway Piano Gallery of Washington, DC, to coordinate moving seven Steinway pianos from School of Music practice rooms in the Carey Smith Performing Arts Center to the homes of students who needed them. This was the uplifting news that we all needed, and it also is an example of academic excellence. This enabled our students in music to continue their studies literally in their homes remotely away from our campus. When COVID-19 canceled music rehearsals and in-person performances, the National Orchestral Institute plus festival had students continue their orchestral training online through intensive rehearsals, intimate master classes, and insightful seminars, as well as offered a virtual coaching program to navigate future career decisions for our students. Audience experienced the festival through live streams, discussions, and broadcasts of their performances. Arts and Humanities has served the community in countless ways. For example, performing arts students and faculty along with staff of the Clarice Costume Shop powered up their sewing machines, you may remember this, to make protective face masks for frontline workers. What a contribution to the pandemic and to these incredibly important frontline workers and their health. Earlier this year, we announced a major milestone in our university's history. The department that Dean Thornton Dill 
used to be the department chair of. The first honorific naming of an academic department at the university in its history, the Harriet Tubman Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. It is fitting that this heroic Marylander is now honored at the state's flagship university, and we are thrilled with this distinction in arts and humanities and at the University of Maryland. I also commend Art Hugh for your leadership in launching most recently during this pandemic, the, the new initiative, Be Worldwise, Worldwise, Get World Ready initiative, with a goal of integrating career development into education to better prepare students for the life after graduation, especially in these challenging times. As Dean Thornton Dill always says at commencement, and she says this at every commencement, <laughs> religiously. 97% of our Hugh students get jobs or continue their graduate education. These alumni have successful careers in a range of industries, including technology, business, arts, and entertainment, nonprofits, law, medicine, and computer science. I'm grateful to the work that you all do to get those students placed. Thus, I support your mission to prepare a versatile and visionary leaders equipped to address the complexities of the human experience, both globally and locally. And I thank you, many of you, for working together on my initiative called Terrapin Strong. It's more than just a mask. Terrapin Strong is an initiative focused on one of my priorities as your president, ensuring that students, faculty, and staff feel welcome, a sense of community, and that they matter and belong to the University of Maryland. More than 100 staff, faculty, and students on campus from every college, school, and division are serving on Terrapin Strong committees to bring this initiative to fruition. Thanks to your hard work, dozens of Terrapin Strong programs are taking place across this university this fall virtually and around the campus, and we're finding ways to share and acknowledge all aspects of our history and show how we're working together toward a deeper sense of inclusion across our entire campus. And finally, in partnership with the David C. Driscoll Center, my wife Sylvia and I have displayed a number of David Driscoll's works of art in our new home, your home, University House. As you know, our distinguished university professor who has, recognized, who has been recognized worldwide as an artist, scholar, and historian of African-American heart, passed away in, in March at the age of 88 from complications to COVID-19. So we honor and remember him for this entire year, and you can see many of his works, of course, in the Driscoll Center, but also in University House. And to end on a positive note, I've invited one of your former alums, Ms. Dominique Doss, an Olympic gymnast, a graduate of the communications department in 2002, to be our winter commencement speaker. And she has agreed. So with that said, uh, I await all of your questions. I'm excited to work with all of you, I'm excited about the future of our, our, of our university and your college. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Um, that's a great start. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about your 12 initiatives. I know people have a lot of questions about the pandemic and, um, and how we're operating, and we will definitely get to those. I was going to take a few minutes, however, to kind of step back a little bit and look at this through um, a broader lens. And you touched on a number of the things that um, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about. Um, because I was really struck in reading through, rereading re again, I guess, your uh, initiatives. Uh, you know, one of the things that we do in the arts and humanities is we read deeply. And, um, and so as I was reading through them, I was um, struck that you, of these things, you talked about uh, building a, a more inclusive environment. And as you've already acknowledged, and you know that that's something that really matters a lot to us. It's very much where we are. 47% of the courses, diversity courses on this campus are offered uh, through this college. Um, and I was interested that you focused on the curriculum mm -hmm. in particular, and also as creating a more inclusive environment. You also talked about community policing. And, and, and that particularly, to me, felt like you were framing it in a context that invited the humanities in, um, that really saw it as a space where history, discourse, language would be essential in helping unpack the complexities of why things are the way they are now. 
uh, so that we can think about um, how they might move forward. That and your notion about advancing the university by really um, uh, that one of the, the ways you saw of advancing the university was greater diversity in faculty, staff, uh, and students. And then finally, you mentioned uh, David Driscoll and highlighting his work, but also to me that spoke not just about David Driscoll, whom we should and do honor, but also raising up African-American art and art in particular as an important element of how we live. And so I just um, wanted to, and you've said a little bit about those things. I don't know if there's some more that you would like to say about that in terms of how you see our college working with you to help move those goals forward um, and what, what you would want to know from us or about us um, that could facilitate that process. Thank you, Bonnie, for giving me a chance to kind of sort of uh, walk everyone through. So, you know, when I was doing the listening sessions around uh, February and a couple in, in March that were virtual, um, this was even sort of even before I think the pandemic was, was at its height, most heightened level. Um, there were the sensitivities around a community, better community building. Um, why we still lack diversity and inclusion and equity across our campus. Um, and there were some issues that the students had about the student experience. And as we all know that the virtual learning environment that we're all in has also exacerbated mental health services for all, not just students, but everybody. So, um, and then of course, as I came into office, you know, we had the horrific murder of George Floyd, which many of us have already forgotten about. And it can never be forgotten about because it is again a redressing of social injustices to marginalized populations that has been a part of the history of this country. So I felt in my two priorities as I articulated them to all of you that it was important that the University of Maryland stands out, put a flag in the ground and said this is important to our campus. And that's what I heard from the community. And so the 12 initiatives that I wrote out were to abroad across three broad areas to improve the student experience, create a more inclusive environment, and to advance the university forward. So in that domain of creating an inclusive environment, I can't see a college playing more heavily in that domain than the College of Arts and Humanities. Through your curriculum, through your scholarship, through your um, leadership in diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and to share those best practices across the university. Um, I've asked uh, a couple of task forces that were already in place before I started. Um, the Senate uh, had a task force on <clears throat> looking at these issues on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the curriculum. And there are some recommendations that are gonna come out that will um, affect the College of Arts and Humanities, but affect the, the colleges across the entire university. That number one, that almost every student should go through the Terrapin Strong onboarding program. Number two, that there has to be a fundamental course across the university that has authentic conversations about race, gender, sexuality, sexual identity, et cetera, issues in our campus. And then as, we, as the students come up through our programming, that each of the disciplines, including those in the arts and humanities, will decide to customize their ability to speak about these difficult issues in curriculum with their students so that all students as they come up will have a, a complex understanding and an understanding in general of these issues. So we are a better community, uh, have a better climate on campus um, and that we possibly go forward. So the arts and humanities are key to that because as we look possibly at um, the diversity requirement of the general education courses, is there an opportunity um, to add authentic conversations and new curricula to that particular domain. I don't know, that's gonna come out of discussions with all of you. It'll come out of discussions in the Senate, but I think it's an opportunity to us for really to say, it is opportunity for, for all of us to move to a new plateau of a better community for the entire University of Maryland. So that's number one. Number two, you've already been doing this, uh, Dean Thornton deal in terms of creating, creating a more inclusive faculty but that hasn't been happening across the entire university. And so my you know, almost number one initiative will be to really support 
the growth of diverse faculty across our university. It is something that I heard at every listening session. I have now seen authentic conversations in units talking about this and how that they could actually achieve them across the campus. So I really would love for us to achieve, a, again, a better plateau, a better sense of community, a better sense of respect for one another uh, going forward. And of course, the College of Arts and Humanities plays a key role in that, in that leadership. So um, I'll stop there because you know, I can just ramble on and on. You know how I am, Bonnie, so, so I'll stop there. Um, but there, I, I just think your college plays in all these domains. And of course, as you know, uh, because of what happened to um, Mr. Floyd, um, we were almost had to have a review of community policing at our campus to really get community buy-in, to build a better trust with our um, public safety officials, but to also redress some issues of racial profiling, some issues of use of force, some issues related to militarization of the police. These are legitimate concerns and our police department has never undergone a review, so this was appropriate. And I appreciate your leadership as a co-chair with Dean Ball. Uh, I think some good recommendations will come out of that. Well, again, enhance our community uh, going forward. So, so I'll stop there. Thank you. So um, let me just follow up, and then we'll I'll, I'll, I'll open up. But when you did you did your listening sessions, as you said, the pandemic was just kind of beginning to, and then by the time you made these recommendations. We were full scale ahead, although none of us could have imagined all of the things that we have gone through. So I just wonder how the pandemic um, has adapted your thinking and how the, um, so how you've thought about these differently as a, as a result of the pandemic and how the pandemic has changed perhaps some of your expectations. These were, you know, some of these ideas I was, I was going to do, I thank you for phrasing the question uh, based on the timeline. Um, these things I, were, I was going, many of these things I was going to do anyway. However, I think because of the two pandemics, I am now doubling down on these uh, items because they're even more needed than ever. You know, um, uh, you know, look, we're about to go through one of the most, I don't even know how to describe it, maybe one of the most controversial periods in the history of the election process in our country. And we have, an, that's the third pandemic that's coming, if you, if you can look at it that way. And, and let me tell you why this is so important. There are, if you remember in 2016, how the campus felt, and, and, and I'm not talking about any person's political persuasion, I don't wanna go there, but this is so polarized that it's quite possible that we won't know an outcome for weeks possibly, maybe months, I hope not, but that's gonna cause our community to be in such an uproar. So we are actually already planning as an administration, uh, we're about to open up a, an election portal, uh, which will allow faculty to um, uh, use coping techniques that we're gonna provide on this portal for you to use in your classrooms with your students. Um, we're gonna have safe spaces for students to protest because from either side of the political persuasion, doesn't matter. Um, we're getting ready for a long process that could be ugly. Um, and, and we all as faculty and staff and students, you know, we need to get ready for this because this is something we've never faced before. So it'll be the third pandemic all in the same 2020. I mean, again, this is an amazing year. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. It will go down. You guys will never forget this. I will never forget it. If you thought 9-11 was bad, I mean, we would never forget the year of 2020. And so, um, so and we're, and again, at the core of it is about the human experience, right? The core of it. So arts and humanities plays a really key role in helping us all really be able to express our views, understand what is what we're going through, and be able to get on the other side of it, right? So, so your your college is key to me. So. Thank you. So I'm going to um, turn it over to our moderators, um, Jordana Moore-Sergese from the Department of Art History, Thomas Zeller from the Department of History, and Kelly Flanagan, who is Chair of the Arts and Humanities Staff Council to um, open up with questions. And I was supposed to say at the beginning, and I didn't, that this is being recorded. Um, so I am saying it now and um, so Jordana and Tom, I don't know which one of you is going to, and Kelly, I don't know who's going to start. Okay, Jordana. Thank you, Dean Thornton-Dell. 
um, and President Pines for starting this conversation and um, for the opportunity to moderate this um, discussion along with my colleagues, Tom Zeller and Kelly Flanagan. I wanted to take just a few moments before we begin to outline the process for this portion of the town hall. We collected questions um, during the registration process, which were then forwarded to the Office of the President and reviewed by the moderators um, prior to today's meeting. We've attempted to group the submitted questions into several relevant um, categories. There are five in total. Um, we'll spend a few minutes on each. Um, you can imagine that um, many of the categories relate to COVID-19, um, but we've attempted really to address the specific strengths and challenges of ARHU um, in these queries. So, you know, following up on your discussion with um, Dean Thornton Dell, we'll begin with the discussion of the vision for the arts and humanities at University of Maryland. We have questions um, coming around communication and future planning, the impact of enrollment on budgets and delivery of instruction, on-campus presence, and then finally the impact of COVID-19 on university employees and caregiver roles, especially related to evaluation and promotion of those um, employees. So the three moderators will alternate asking questions along with invited faculty and staff who will read their own submitted questions. And if time allows, we'll post follow-up questions um, for you, President Pines. Um, drawing from questions submitted um, by the registrants. I want everyone to note that we will not have time um, to address all of the submitted questions, um, but we've made every effort to represent all major concerns. If you find um, uh, that you have a question that wasn't answered this morning, please feel free to follow up with us via the post-event survey um, that we'll, you'll receive via email. I also encourage you to reach out to your shared governance representatives within ARHU, which includes the Collegiate Council and also the Staff Council. Um, during our discussion, you have the opportunity to use the chat function to send questions privately um, to Thomas Zeller directly. Um, we ask that you do that in order to maintain um, a, you know, a less busy um, screen um, rather than chatting to everyone um, in this meeting. Um, it will also allow us to, to position questions anonymously um, and respect your privacy um, if, if that's something that needs to be done. So um, my long-winded explanation is over and I'll turn it over um, now to Kelly Flanagan who will pose the first question. Hi, thank you so much, uh, President Pine, uh, Dean Burton Dill, and all the faculty and staff who are joining us. Um, I, I want to just real quick pause and uh, note that the people that we have lost in our own college and university and personal lives and um, express that. Um, we're also thankful to their roles and thinking about that difficulty. So the thing we thought to start with is you know, the world's changing. You mentioned there's a huge role for arts and humanities. Um, you said, you know, you, you agree that it's a super important thing to be incorporated. I guess we want to kind of drill into like how, um, how you maybe would approach that. One, one thing that was brought up in the questions is how you're sort of tracking metrics and planning moving forward to see how the university will need to make these big changes in our future as it comes forward and how ARHU will keep up, or sorry, how UMD will keep up with that and specifically incorporate ARHU? I know that's a really big question, but <laughs> maybe just pick one thing. Well, I mean, um, thank you, Kelly, appreciate it. Um, so I, I think, you know, I think let's, let's talk at a high level. Um, and Bonnie will, will know about this because she's been in a couple of these meetings. So I, I want you all to understand that, you know, obviously we, we, we have, we're all going through something really incredible that is uh, uh, really a, a seminal moment in the history of humankind on the planet, right? And higher education is just part of that, right? The, the work that we do, it's, it's affecting every industry, it's affecting our business, but it's sort of a wake up call to higher education. So that's all the colleges, all the disciplines that higher education um, must look at this as both a crisis but also an opportunity to reimagine itself and how we deliver the work that we do in education, research, and service, right? So that's the high level, right? And so, so we, so for example, if I would have walked into the College of Arts and Humanities and said to Bonnie, and then had the same town hall with all of you and said to all the faculty and staff, and, and I'll just pick on somebody. So if I said to Bill, <laughs> And I, it's only because I know Bill. 
and, and just pick on and say, Bill, tomorrow, next week, I want you to be online. I don't care what you tell me, you're gonna be online. Bill will tell me to get out, of, get out of his office and don't ever come back, right? So we went in a matter of two weeks to 100% virtual learning modality because we had to. We would have never done that if I had asked you all to do that. Maybe 5% of you would have done it. Even if I gave you 10K on your salary increase, you, some of you still would have never done it. But we all had to do that to keep our business of what we do, which is delivering education to our students, um, going. Now, what has that um, allowed us to rethink about? It's like, okay, we did that immediately in March, and it, you know, it went okay. It didn't go great, but it went okay. We got, we got through it all. But we had the summer to kind of rethink and reimagine and replan, and we literally gave out 600,000 or 600 um, grants to faculty, and they were able to reinvent there are courses that are maybe even better online or a combination of blended, hybrid, and virtual, 100% online, than ever before. And so that now is allowing us to think about, oh, how could we deliver our courses and the experiences to our students in a better way, right? This is, this is the transformational thing that's happening to all of us. We're not there yet. We're still in that infancy uh, embryonic stage. So the College of Arts and Humanities plays an enormous role in the delivery of education on this campus. So this is where one area in which uh, the college comes into play. Um, but it also comes into play in terms of just the student experience probably and how we're going to ex execute that. It comes into play in new programs. So for example, um, there's a new immersive media design partnership between RHU and CMNS, which I think is gonna be a super exciting across the campus major which will probably fill up really quickly because of the collaboration between two colleges that will um, lead to a lot of excitement for students. And then how to think that how we're gonna read the, deliver this um, curriculum to our students can, and can now um, start, which I think is gonna be very exciting. Um, so, so I think there are lots of areas that are gonna be um, super exciting for us to reimagine uh, the arts, um, performing arts, visual arts, how are we going to do that in this potentially exciting virtual modality? We've already seen examples that I actually gave in my opening remarks about what you did in the music department, right? What you did in helping the COVID um, pandemic by providing customizable PPE to our um, frontline um, support staff. So your community plays an important role in how we adapt and reimagine ourselves going forward. And I'm excited to see what the new generation of arts and humanities will look like. We are just starting those discussions at the leadership level. So the deans and the uh, vice presidents just had a retreat and we are looking for your big ideas to invest in, right? Even though we're in a financial crisis as well, we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna just, you know, be mirrored in um, saying, woe is us. We need to think about how to reinvent ourselves and what we are gonna do strategically going forward. Thank you, President Pines. I have a, a just a quick follow-up question for you related to that. And, you know, probably for many of my colleagues in the arts humanities, one of the, the words that sort of jumped out to me in listening to your response was business. Um, you know, and so, you know, within the, the sort of business model of higher education, you know, dealing with a college of arts humanities, which is I mean, I, I don't think we can say the most lucrative um, <laughs> um, of the colleges within the university. You know, I think one question that, that we had coming in was about, you know, how do you continue to support and value the arts and humanities, especially within a business model, but also in the midst um, of an economic um, challenge that you find yourself in? So I'm going to phrase this um, from one specific question um, that came in, and that was, would you be willing to take on the job of championing the arts and humanities as fields? in their own right, and as fields that are relevant courses of study, including as minors or second majors for students in all fields? So uh, I'm gonna say this, because I, I always get these questions from um, my colleagues in the arts and humanities, and I wanna say this to all of you, and I want you guys to hear it clearly from me, and I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, by the way. Um, I'm not the president of the STEM colleges. I'm the president of the entire university. Right? And I value everything that happens here. We're a comprehensive university. I have been on this campus for 25 years. I have worked with almost every college in multiple ways. 
as a faculty member, as a dean, as a department chair. Um, so I value all the work that goes on in this campus. And I'm looking for exciting ideas that are coming from the College of Arts and Humanities. I have been told, Bonnie, that I might even be more deferential to social science in the College of Arts and Humanities than the STEM colleges. And I've already told her that a thousand times because I know you guys are watching. <laughs> and, I, and I just want to make sure that you know that I care about you, and I do. Um, and even in this virtual environment, um, many of the things that I've already experienced have not been in STEM colleges. I've gone around this campus and talked to folks in different disciplines across the campus that I don't know very well um, so that I can understand them more. I'm looking for big ideas that will help move our university to a new, incredible, exciting place of excellence and scholarship and impact. And I'm looking for the College of Arts and Humanities to be in that space, both academically and curriculum and in scholarship and in service. Great, thank you. Um, I was also struck in your conversation with Dean Thornton Dell around your commitments to creating a more diverse faculty and a more inclusive faculty um, here at the University of Maryland. Um, can you speak a little bit more uh, about your vision for that? And in particular, I'm interested in um, not just recruitment, but retention yeah. um, of faculty, of diverse faculty. And I'm also, you know, thinking through not to make this too complicated, but, you know, within the sort of larger landscape of higher education, many graduate programs have paused admissions this year. We know that, you know, from several studies, um, you know, that have been coming out in the last few weeks that this will directly impact the diversity of the incoming class um, as many of those students um, aren't can't afford to wait a year to enter graduate school. So how are you thinking around these, these sort of, you know, um, co-occurring issues around diversity and inclusivity? Yeah, I think that um, we have to uh, get together as a campus and make sure that this is one of our highest priorities across all colleges um, that are not just coming out of the president's office, but every unit within their college feels that this is important to them. Um, we, it's, our, it's a chance, a moment in time, an inflection point to really diversify the graduate pool and our faculty. I think we've done reasonably well at the undergraduate level, but I think we still need work there. But the real work has to be done in the graduate level, at the next level, which is postdocs, and of course, as conversion to actual faculty. And then finally, as you mentioned, the issue of retention at the University of Maryland um, is an issue. Uh, both Thor uh, Dean Thornton, Dill, and I um, were participants in the advanced program. I was one of the co-PIs of the advanced program. And that program studied um, faculty equity as well as faculty agency across the university. And we found some gaps that hurt us in retention. Um, we found that, that we could recruit diverse faculty to our community, but they, we didn't retain them uh, in comparable numbers going forward. So what we are going to do going forward is still implement those really good programs. So we have that postdoctoral um, program that even though we didn't execute very well, I think it's a good program that allows conversion to the professoriate, but we need to make sure that the unit heads understand that. Um, we have the uh, diverse um, full professor opportunity uh, hire program that we're gonna put more emphasis on going forward. But I also think that we need to implement some best practices um, in our retention policies across the university. And that's the next thing for us to do to make it really stick and that our faculty stay with us and feel that there's a sense of community, agency, and that they belong here at the University of Maryland. And I think that's been the gap in many colleges across the University of Maryland. But, you know, in the College of Varsity Managers, I think Dean Thornton Dill and many of the unit heads have done a really good job to diversify the faculty. Um, it's, it shows up in how people feel. It shows up in, in the numbers. Um, and I think some of the practices that you guys have, we could be shared across other colleges um, to be useful across uh, even many of the STEM colleges to make these practices stick for everyone. So, of course, it will Thank require you. money. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing well, happens without money, especially in the that, faculty level. Um, along that same line, our, our faculty and staff have been you know, functioning throughout the pandem pandemic pandemic. Um, I just, I think really hard about also the staff diversity who, you know, there's, there's more diversity in our faculty and staff. And sometimes, you know, those individuals are maybe on a worse end as far as um, the struggles they have to deal with during this period. So um, I guess 
the question I will lead into is, I think it's amazing that you're focusing on arts and humanities um, to build the university moving forward. I wonder what mechanisms are there to communicate from both faculty and staff about ways um, to grow that with the innovative ideas and also to keep that functioning in the best manner <laughs> as far as staff roles and keeping people paid and things of that nature. So I'm, I'm not completely clear on your question. Uh, so um, are you what, talking about professional track faculty or? Um, you know what? Um, for faculty, staff, you know, everyone working, um, how can we get our ideas, um, solutions, or concerns to people who can make change to your uh, office? Okay. So I still have my um, Voices of Maryland portal, um, which I collect ideas from the entire community about anything, about curriculum, about, um, you know, professional track faculty, about staff issues about how to improve the university's operation. So that's still an open mechanism for everyone. It's called the Voices of Maryland portal. You can get it off the president's website. Um, but also your, your other way of connecting to the president's office is through your leadership. So through uh, Dean Thornton Dill, um, she'll get information to the chief of staff, which is Michelle Eastman. And that eventually gets to the cabinet and to the president's office. So there are many ways to get your ideas to the forefront and to hopefully get them part of the discussion for how to improve our campus. Great, thank you, President Pines. I realize that we are um, already at 10.39. Um, so I, I wanna, you know, we had several questions come in, um, as I, we mentioned from the, the faculty and staff, and we wanted to, in order to make this a little bit more personal and, and have an opportunity for you to meet more than just the moderators, um, have them in, ask those questions directly and read them to you. So the first question is actually coming um, from Alexandra Calloway um, from the Department of English. Um, Alexandra, if you're there, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you for having me uh, today. Uh, my question is, how well is the university doing with retaining students and recruiting new students for next year? Um, and what are the impacts to the budget for the instructional faculty in regards to the available classes and to our FTE um, with the, the students' um, level of participation in college classes? Hi, Dr. Calloway, how are you doing? First of all, thank you for the work you've done. I, I should share with them, everybody doesn't know that she's been working with me as a dean on engineering grammar. Um, and uh, she's done some exciting work. So I just wanted to share that with you, just a little personal connection between Dr. Dow, uh, Calloway and I. Um, uh, in regards to your question, Dr. Calloway, so um, the enrollment numbers are, um, are holding strong and our diversity in our enrollment numbers, both undergrad and even a little bit less on the grad side are holding strong. As you all know, we, we have suffered probably the largest financial um, crisis in the history of the University of Maryland, in the history of the state of Maryland. Um, and that's true across the system. But in our guidance that came through the University Senate, we tried to really minimize the effects to the most vulnerable populations, right? Which includes our contract employees, our summer lower paid staff, our union employees, um, to make sure that any cuts that were going to be made were minimal as they related to them. Uh, we've tried to minimize uh, layoffs across the university. Now, um, at, the, at the campus level, at the administration level, those were our guiding principles. Each individual college and individual, individual units can make their local decisions on their local budgets. So, but we've tried to protect all of our most vulnerable populations, which we usually include our lower paid staff, some of our contractual staff, our professional track faculty to the best of our ability um, as it stands today. Um, but now all of that rolls down into the colleges and they're allowed to make their own uh, decisions based on their own um, needs. And so, um, but we try to minimize that across the university to individual um, folks who work for all of us and help deliver education. So hopefully you've seen that um, and I hope you felt that um, because that's what we've tried to do. I hope that answers your question. Okay. I think 
um, has a follow-up question coming in um, here that he would like to pose. Tom? I guess good morning, everybody. President Pines, I've been getting a couple of messages over the chat, and we've also had several uh, that came in before uh, the meeting. And it has to do with uh, job security, or rather lack thereof, for professional track faculty. And as you know, uh, there's a great deal of uncertainty, if not fear, among professional track faculty. So we've gotten several messages sort of asking for a commitment to professional uh, track faculty and the roles that they play. Uh, and in several units within AHU, they teach uh, many classes in many sections. So I think this is a, a, an issue that's probably specific to AHU more so than in other colleges even. So they, you know, can, can you give an assurance to professional track faculty that they will continue to be able to do the work that they've been doing over the last couple of years? That's a question that we've been getting. And, and let me say just one thing before you answer, and that is that most of the professional track faculty in the College of Arts and Humanities are teaching instructional faculty and not research faculty. Yeah. So Dr. Joe, I can't give guarantees on anybody, even tenure track faculty. Uh, what I mean by that is um, we've been able to mitigate the cost for this cycle, like fiscal 21, and which is what I just, I just articulated this earlier, saying minimizing the sort of financial impact to the most vulnerable, including professional track faculty, which is what I just said. But that's for this current cycle. I can't guarantee, you know, as, as a fiscal manager of the university, I can't guarantee anyone not going to be impacted going forward because I don't know what those numbers are. So that doesn't mean that we don't value it in the, at the university level, our instructional faculty or tenure track faculty. It means that we might have to look at very difficult decisions if the state's budget is really bad. I, can't, I don't control that, right? Um, clearly instruction is, is a high priority to all of us, and especially in the college, and that will be a high priority for me as well, but that doesn't mean that I can guarantee that everyone will be protected. I have no control of that fiscally. If the state comes down to the University of Maryland College Park and says, we have to cut 50% of your base budget, uh, that's a big challenge for us. This first cycle, fiscal 21, we actually had a, a request from the state that was a 7.5% base budget cut. That's a $47 million of our budget. Um, now, somehow, we were able to absorb 32 million of that centrally. And then we went and got some of it from the colleges. Um, but that was the way where we protected um, faculty today, you know, in fiscal 21 budget cut. Uh, but if there's another significant cut, I can make no guarantees to anyone. Um, I can only work with the college deans and all the leadership team to try to figure out what are the priorities for this college, for the university, and how we can prioritize instructional faculty so that they can potentially um, get through the next cycle. Um, now, fortunately, now, so with all that said, that's my sort of caveat, right? But with all that said, we are lucky. Um, what we're hearing in Annapolis is that the numbers are better than what they thought they were going to be um, for fiscal 22 and for fiscal, this is actually a miracle. We heard, and just to give you all a, a brief update, we heard about four months ago that the first estimates on the returns of revenue to the state where it's going to have a two to three billion dollar shortfall for fiscal 22. And so just to give you guys an update, um, I don't know if you know, but the total state budget in the state of Maryland is about 39, 41 billion dollars. That's the entire state budget. So a two to three billion dollar shortfall is huge and it's structural. We just found out a week ago that that number may be off by $1.7 billion. So that only the shortfall is maybe 300 million. Uh, that more revenue came in than they had predicted. That's huge for us, because that means that hopefully going into fiscal 22, we don't have as big of a cut as we had in fiscal 21. We, we will see, so I don't want you to get your hopes up too high, but that's the early numbers now. Um, so I, I'm sorry that I might not able to say that I can give guarantees, I can't give guarantees. I can only work with everyone and do the best that we can do based on the Senate guidance and our shared governance to do the best strategy for the University of Maryland, which I think we did this time for the fiscal 21 cut. Thank you. 
Recognizing we're low on time, I'm going to invite our second of three questions. Um, Mary Cowles is a business manager in the Department of Art. She is also on staff council. Um, so Mary, if you want to ask your question. Good morning. Um, my question is, how do you see opportunities to telework increasing as we go forward? More specifically, would you be open to reconsidering the return to campus policy for staff so that it's not mandatory, but dependent on the needs of each department? I think um, we, the way we uh, did the, this whole phased opening was I think in consultation uh, through a committee, a shared committee that came up with the guidance for all the colleges. So we gave maximum flexibility to the, the dean and to the unit heads to make individual decisions on how they wanted to staff their offices, allowing for great, greater flexibility for teleworking as so desired. But since we had some students coming back and were forward, and they were forward facing um, positions that were required to interface with our students, we left that to the college deans and the unit heads to figure out a rotation policy that would work for them. And I, I can tell you today um, that I think that has gone really well. I think there was a lot of angst from staff across the, the entire university, but pretty much that's gone really well. And people are allowed to telework where they have, especially the complexity of their family home life if they have young children who are um, obviously on virtual learning um, environments. So we tried to give maximum flexibility to the unit heads, the supervisors, and of course to the college deans. I think that's a good policy for us to have. We also at, did try to do the same thing for faculty. Um, and we said faculty are not getting off here. They have to show up in person. So uh, if they're gonna do their research, they have to file a research plan to return to campus, to open up their laboratories and to have in-person laboratory operation and to be in a safe environment. Everything we've done has been with an abundance of caution and in a phased way and where the priorities of your health of every faculty member, staff member has put at the, at, at the forefront. And, um, and if you compare us, you know, so I'm gonna speak now broadly um, to, to all of you. Um, I think the team and the, we've had 500 people on working groups across the campus to help pull this miracle off, which is the phased opening of our campus. And um, I think the team has done incredibly well. Now, obviously it's impossible to prevent COVID and the prevalence of COVID from in any environment um, when you open up something as big as our university. Um, but to date, we've had a grand total of 38 faculty and staff positive cases. From our testing data, and I'm just gonna say this to your, to your group, from our, I, already, I see all the data. I know every person who's been positive. Um, that has been in our test protocol, that has been, that's gone through our testing. From what I have seen, there's been one person in arts and humanities that's a, that's a, that's a staff member that's tested positive. So I think our process has worked is my point. And I, and I think it's kept our faculty and staff safe and slightly separated from our student population, right? Which, you know, it's difficult for them to maintain beha healthy behaviors, but we have to constantly remind them. Um, but it's kept our prevalence at a low rate. And if you look our, at our dashboard today, I think you'll be proud that we're down to the single digits of numbers now. And uh, so, so our process has worked. It's taken a lot of effort. You know, we're not, I'm not a public health expert. I'm an engineer. But um, I looked at this as a complex problem and I worked with multiple input from our public health officials out of the School of Public Health, Prince George's County Public Health, and the, the State of Maryland Public Health. And so it's been um, with that guidance that we came together with these uh, administrative plans to allow for faculty, staff, and students to return. And, and where it affects you, Mary, is on, on the staff policy. I know it was a long answer, I'm sorry. Um, but just wanted to give background. By the way, I'm willing to go past 11, if everyone else is. Uh, thank you, President Pines. I was just going to say we're, we're sort of running a little bit behind schedule, but I, I appreciate your offer. And we actually had a third question, um, which uh, Jordan had mentioned before, uh, had him to do with uh, childcare uh, and the ramifications um, of that. And uh, so I'd like to introduce Amanda Dykema, and I hope I'm not butchering your last name because I only know you as Amanda. 
Uh, she's a research and grant writing coordinator in the College of Aarhus Arts and Humanities. Are you there, Amanda? I am. Thank you, Tom. Um, and you got my name correct, so uh, good work. Um, here to help me ask my question today is Max, also. Hi, Max. Hi, <laughs> President Pines. Um, President Pines, as you know, lack of child care is an ongoing crisis for UMD employees, both faculty and staff. Yes, it is. Um, the new UMD Bright Horizons Daycare that you mention frequently in these types of events has once again delayed its opening and no new date has yet been publicized. Parents of school-aged children are asked to work full-time and help their children navigate virtual learning full-time with high stakes for failure. Workers, especially women, are leaving the workforce in record numbers in response to these pressures. And at UMD, it will only get worse the more staff and faculty are asked to return to campus while this pandemic continues. So my question is, what actions is UMD taking to mitigate the effects of this crisis for our um, employees? And this is the piece that I care about the most. How will you assess the effectiveness of these actions? Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Max, for being here as well. Um, I mean, we empathize with you, Amanda. I personally empathize with you. Um, of course, my children are in their 20s, um, so they don't, I don't have this problem. Um, and, I, and I think it's really a struggle for you and families like you. And so we have created a, a mini um, committee um, headed up by Michelle Eastman, the chief of staff. We are considering um, a variety of, of options. Um, and we hope that in another two or three weeks that we'll solidify these uh, options for uh, child care for our employees. Um, we are very upset that the new child care center is not opening on time. Uh, the license wasn't approved by the state of Maryland. That's the delay. It's very frustrating. We've been, we've been pushing them. But even that's not enough because that only could accommodate only a fraction of the population. So this is probably, to me, your issue, Amanda, and, and many of folks here in arts and many, but across the university, is the, the, the one I struggle the most with, to be honest with you. Uh, this is a, a real challenging time for families and also elder care for those who have elder parents at, at their home. So we are looking at some solutions that are possibly in the form of bringing in folks onto our campus to provide daycare services. We are looking at options where we are also deploying daycare providers to your homes. Um, this is what we're considering. Um, we haven't worked out all the details yet, um, but I hope, I'm hopeful that another two or three weeks that we'll have this plan ready to, pre to present to everyone on the campus and give you options, uh, almost like a smorgasbord of what you could choose. And we also hope that the license for the uh, physical daycare will be ready. Um, and then we'll, we'll have to survey you to see how it's going um, in terms of an assessment. Um, again, this is a domain that we've never been in before as a university where we're in this complex environment. But it's the one that I definitely struggle the most with. And, uh, and I've heard it from many families. And so again, this is where we are. We're working on it. Uh, I, I, you know, we've talked to Johns Hopkins. We've talked to other universities in the region. They're all struggling with the same thing. Johns Hopkins has worked out a very similar program. So that's why we've been talking to them. Um, they were able to execute it ahead of us uh, this semester. I think when we get uh, these options available, we'll be, we won't have them ready for this semester. They'll probably be ready for the spring semester. So. Um, President Pines, there was one uh, a question that came in earlier, and I think it's a good follow-up. It has to do with faculty who are, uh, you know, at an age where they where they raise children, um, and for reasons that are, you know, too complex to go into right now, women still do more childcare work than men. And the data I got this morning said that about sixty percent of the assistant professors in Ahu are female. Um, and so there's already been an extension of the tenure clock this spring for all faculty. I understand they had to request it. But is this something that you're considering given the kind of situation that Amanda described, which apply, you know, applies equally to, to faculty as well? Yeah. I Sorry about that, hit my microphone. Um, um, I, I said that I think the deans um, are very much on top of this. 
where we've automatically granted um, extensions and lots of flexibility, extending of the ten tenure clock, of course, um, but also even other resources. And there may be the case where um, you know, some, someone may require teaching relief because of the complexity of their situation. So we, we've allowed that to go forward on an individual uh, basis with each of the college departments and deans. Um, so I think there will be a lot of flexibility during this incredible time period to ensure that people can manage their work-life balance, which is very complicated. Thank you, President Pines. I, I realize that we're getting very close um, to, to 11 o'clock. And maybe the, the best way, um, I realize that a lot of questions are coming in from the chat. Um, you know, it's just impossible to get the level of detail potentially that we need um, at this uh, juncture. But I will, again, encourage everyone to, I know Lauren um, Campbell put in the chat the Voices of Maryland form where we can solicit further feedback um, from attendees as well as the post-event survey. Um, to end, I think maybe the, the best way would be for us to ask just one additional question, which would be about, you know, communication and future planning. You know, I, I think it would be nice to know, I think, from the faculty and staff perspective, how are critical decisions being made? Um, you know, especially around things like on-campus presence, around in-person graduation, um, around um, limiting access to campus. Could you walk us just briefly through, you know, what are the, some of the things that you're considering when you're making these large scale decisions um, that impact all of us um, on campus? And how do you plan to, um, you know, communicate these decisions um, as we move forward? Yeah, so when we uh, did the phased opening of the physical campus, we had, I think, seven or eight working groups that were a combination of faculty, staff, and students from around the university. Um, and that input, along with community members' input, helped us develop the sort of for Maryland phased opening, reopening plan. Then we came forward and we communicated that information to the college deans, which then they communicated it to you. Um, and then we obviously came out with the campus messaging, um, which was along mandatory testing before you came back to campus, and then testing when you came back to campus, and then another large round of testing sort of three weeks into the semester um, to keep the campus safe. So that was a process. We are in the same process now uh, where we're engaging the deans, which are, and also the unit heads and the division heads in a discussion about what are we gonna do after Thanksgiving? Are we gonna come back to campus? Do we wanna come back to campus? So that's one part of the discussion. The other part of the discussion is, what are we doing with winter? It's gonna be winter virtual, more likely it will be. So that, that just makes sense. And then what we're, we're, we're just now starting the planning exercises for the spring. You know, what will the spring be? Will it be similar to the fall? And we have the similar, similar hybrid modality. Um, what I can tell you all is that the testing has gotten really much better. That's number one. Number two, we're about to move to a new modality of testing. That is, uh, we're gonna move to something that's uh, antigen testing, which will allow us to test you and give your results within 15 to 30 minutes. So you don't get it two days later, you get it in 15, 30 minutes. Um, that alone will help us keep our campus even safer uh, going forward. So um, again, the way we do it, the Jordana is that we can communicate it through the campus deans who communicate it to the department heads who communicate it to their college communities. Um, and then we come out with messaging to the campus community. Great, thank you so much. I just wanted to say, you know, that um, I, I personally really appreciate, um, you know, you coming um, to RU and speaking with us today. And, you know, on behalf of the faculty and staff, I, I just really wanna thank both Dean Thornton Dill and President Pines just for your commitment to transparency, um, you know, to, to really the consideration of the hu human dimension um, of all that we're going through um, in this very difficult moment. So I'll hand it back over to Dean Thornton. Can, can I can I say one last thing, uh, Bonnie? Sure, of course. Uh, so, so I want to I want to read something to all of you. Um, it's from. Um, it's sort of the connect to the times that we're in um, from uh, an author. So I would just like to read an, an excerpt of an essay because I think it will embody sort of almost the entire discussion that we're having. So this excerpt of an essay, it's called The Pandemic 
is a portal. I've already mentioned this, but it's really a selection from an, uh, an author named Aruhati Roy, forthcoming book on Azadi, freedom and fascism. I'm sure many of you know this. So she writes, what is this thing that has happened to us? It's a virus, yes. In and of itself, it holds no moral brief, but it's definitely more than a virus. Some believe it's God's way of bringing us to our senses. Others, that it's a Chinese conspiracy to take over the world. Whatever it is, coronavirus has made the mighty kneel and brought the world to halt like nothing else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists. And in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than the return to normality. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred or avarice or our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk through lightly with a little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. The pandemic is a portal. The question I leave you with is what will our hue become as it passes through this portal? Thank you. Well, thank you, um, President Pines. You have just stolen the end of my state of the campus. I've got to go redo the whole thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> that means great minds think alike. <laughs> Right, but um, thank you so much for joining us today. I just, I wanna remind people that in the chat is the link to the Voices of Maryland form. Um, there's also the um, feedback form for this um, uh, forum, this town hall. And there's also a link for staff uh, communications with the Dean in the college uh, around these issues. We. You know, there's so much to talk about. And um, we, as, as Jordana said, we couldn't get into all the details of everything, but we certainly appreciate your uh, being here, your sharing your thoughts with us. I think in terms of my goal of having this be an opportunity for us to become acquainted with one another, I think it's a good start. And so I really uh, appreciate your being here today. So thank, thank you, you and thank all of you for uh, showing up for your engagement and uh, involvement in this. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.